Welcome back to Real Life Behind the Scenes, where we take a look at real stories that inspire the movies and TV shows we all know and love. Today we will be looking at the movie Split. As always, if you did not watch this movie, I highly recommend you watch it now before you watch this video, as there are major spoilers ahead. Don't worry, we'll wait for you. Back? Okay, perfect. Just in case you forgot or you don't feel like watching the movie, I'll give a quick plot summary. Kevin Wendell Crumb, a man suffering from Dissociate Identity Disorder, also known as DID, has been seeing his psychiatrist, Dr. Fletcher, in order to keep his 23 personalities in check. However, without the psychiatrist knowing, one of Kevin's malicious personalities comes to light, Patricia. This personality makes Kevin kidnap three young women and keep them captive. As the women try to escape, Patricia tries to awaken Kevin's 24th personality, the Beast, which is a Hulk-like personality that gives Kevin super strength and blind rage. Only one of them makes it out alive after a violent chase, which in the end forces Kevin to flee. So that's the story, but there's no way this is a real disorder, right? Louis Vivet, born in Paris in 1863 to a single mother, never met his father. His mother was a sex worker and didn't have the first clue as to who the father was. Louis's mother took out her frustrations on the child, abusing him both mentally and physically, leading to Louis being afflicted with attacks of hysteria and temporary paralysis from a young age. When he was 17, Lewis found himself paralyzed from the waist down after a viper wrapped itself around his hand and bit him. Unable to walk, Lewis was sent to live in the asylum of Bonneville, where he would be taught the trade of a tailor. A month into his stay at the asylum, Lewis began to suffer from violent convulsions and epileptic fits, which often left him unconscious. A year and a half into his stay at the asylum, Lewis woke from one of his fits, stood up, and demanded his clothes so that he could go work in the fields. He did not recognize any of the hospital staff or any of the other patients, and was very confrontational. Unlike the Lewis everyone knew at the asylum, Lewis became a troublesome patient, starting fights and trying to escape on multiple occasions. He also stopped having his seizures. After a few months, Lewis was pronounced cured and released from the hospital. Coincidentally, this happened when he turned 18 and the asylum would no longer get paid for Lewis's care from the government. Upon release, Lewis went to see his mother and got himself a job. He became ill again and spent 18 months in an asylum at St. George. While there, Lewis once again began to have his epileptic fits accompanied by his paralysis. The hospital staff found out when paralyzed, Lewis was calm and gentle. But when he was able to walk, he was very malicious, becoming a thief as well as being angry and confrontational. When he was once again able to walk, Lewis believed it was January of 1884. In fact, it was April of 1884. When paralyzed, Lewis had no interest in wine and would eat sparingly, often giving his food to the other patients. But when he was able to walk, Lewis loved wine and would regularly steal food from others. Neither version of Lewis had memories of the other. Lewis spent years in and out of asylums and jails. At the time, the doctors who studied Lewis believed that he had as many as 10 identities. Today is believed that he had no more than two, with the other personalities being a direct result from hypnosis by his therapist. It would be a hundred years before anyone started to put together Lewis's tortured childhood with the causes of his disorder. There are some that believe that Lewis never had this disorder, but suffered from a dissociative fog. But nobody can say for sure either way. This is the first recorded case related to the disorder. The history of Lewis ends on October 20th, 1886. The last mention of Lewis as a patient at Bistry Hospital in Paris. It is unknown how or when Lewis died, but his story would inspire the classic novel, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. As explained in Split, there is still a disagreement in the medical community as to the reality of DID. While the disorder has been studied for well over a hundred years, there is no consensus on how to properly diagnose the issue and how to treat it. 
DID became a better known disorder in the 1970s. And with the exponential growth of cases came drastic changes. People with DID usually suffered from two to three personalities, but were now suffering with up to 16. DID became a common defense in court cases in the US, where the disorder appears to happen at an astonishing rate compared to the rest of the world. It became apparent that with more people learning of DID came an untold number of false reports on the disorder leaving those who honestly suffer from it lost in the mix, unable to find help they so desperately need. So we confirm this is a real disease, but is there a story that closely resembles Kevin Wendell Crumb? Billy Milligan was born in February 1955 in Miami Beach to Dorothy Milligan and Johnny Morrison. Johnny Morrison struggled with fatherhood. Meeting the medical expenses for Billy's birth overwhelmed Johnny. He borrowed more, gambled more, drank more, and he was soon hospitalized for alcoholism and depression in 1958 after what was believed to be a suicide attempt. Dorothy found him slumped over the table, half a bottle of scotch and an empty bottle of sleeping pills on the floor. A few months after this attempt, on January 17, 1958, Johnny committed suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning in the family car. After his death, Dorothy took her children and moved away from Miami, eventually returning to Lancaster, Ohio. In 1962, she met Chalmer Milligan. Chalmer's first wife, Bernice, divorced him on grounds of gross neglect of their children. He had a daughter, Chawla, the same age as Billy. Dorothy and Chalmer married in Circleville, Ohio on October 27, 1963. Fast forward seven years in 1975, Billy was imprisoned at Lebanon Correctional Institution in Ohio for rape and armed robbery. He was released on parole in early 1977 and was required to register as a sex offender. However, in October of 1977, Milligan was arrested for raping three more women on the Ohio State University campus. He was identified by one of his victims from existing police mugshots of sex offenders and from his fingerprints that were lifted from the victim's car. One of the victims said that he was actually quite nice and that he kind of acted like a three-year-old girl. Since he used a gun during the crime and guns were found in the search of his residence, he had violated his parole as well. He was indicted on three accounts of kidnapping, three accounts of aggravated robbery, and four accounts of rape. He then was sent to Ohio State Penitentiary. In the course of preparing his defense, he underwent a psychological evaluation by Dr. Willis Driscoll, who diagnosed Milligan with schizophrenia. He was then examined by psychologist Dorothy Turner. During this examination, Turner concluded that Milligan suffered from multiple personality disorder. Milligan's public defenders pleaded an insanity defense, and he was committed until such time as he regained sanity. Billy Milligan is the first person in American legal history to be acquitted of a crime based on a psychological condition. Basically, his lawyers argued that Billy didn't do it, his other personalities did. Throughout his trial and after his sentencing, Billy was committed to a series of state-run mental hospitals. While he was in these hospitals, Billy reported having 10 different personalities. These 10 were the only ones known to psychologists. Later on, an additional 14 personalities labeled the undesirables were discovered. It was also discovered that Chalmer, Billy's stepfather, was abusing Billy at a young age. Billy reported having multiple personalities from as far back as five years old when he had three. Doctors theorized this was a coping mechanism for the abuse he was receiving. In case you were curious, this is a list of all the personalities that reside within Billy, starting with the 10, which include Billy Milligan, which is his core personality, Arthur, who is an extremely sophisticated and educated Englishman, an expert in science and medicine with a focus on hematology. He is in the spotlight 
that is in charge of the body during times that required intellectual thinking. The next personality is known only as Reagan, and he is the keeper of hate. His name comes from the words rage again. Reagan describes himself as Yugoslavian, has a Slavic accent, can write and speak in Serbian, and is extraordinarily strong. He controls the spot in dangerous times and can designate group members as undesirable. He admitted committing robbery in order to support the family, but had no knowledge of the rapes. Alan is a con man and a manipulator. He is the most common person to talk to on the outside world. He plays the drums and paints portraits. Also the only right-handed self. He is the only personality that smokes cigarettes. Tommy is an escape artist. He is often confused with Alan. He plays the tenor sax and is an electronics expert. He is also a painter specializing in landscapes. Danny is afraid of people, especially men. He only paints still life portraits and never paints landscapes. He said this was because Chalmer made him dig his own grave and buried him in it. David, age 8, is the keeper of pain. He comes to the spot to take the pain of the others. Christine, age 3, was the one who would stand in the corner in school when Billy would get in trouble. She had dyslexia, but Arthur taught her to read and write. Reagan has a special bond with her. Christopher, Christine's brother, plays the harmonica. Adelana, a lesbian, cooks and cleans houses for others and writes poetry. Milligan's attorney claimed that Adelana had committed the rapes without the knowledge of Milligan or the other alter egos. Next are the 14 undesirables. These people were labeled undesirable after breaking the rules laid down by Regan and Arthur. These alter egos were no longer allowed on the spot, that is to hold consciousness, and only revealed themselves after Milligan was sent to the hospital. Phil is a thug and took part in planning some small time crimes. He has a Brooklyn accent, marked as undesirable due to being a criminal. Kevin is a criminal planner. He helped devise a plan to rob a drugstore. Also labeled as undesirable because he's a criminal. Walter is an Australian. He calls himself a big game hunter and has an excellent sense of direction. Was often used as a spotter. He was labeled because he shot and killed a crow. April only has thoughts about destroying Billy's stepfather. Declared an undesirable when she convinced Regan to kill Chalmer. Luckily, Arthur was able to talk him out of it at the last second. Samuel is a Jewish person and the only one who believes in God. Was marked because he sold some of the other people's personal paintings. Mark is the workhorse. He's often referred to as a zombie because he does nothing unless he is told and will stare at the walls when he's bored. Steve is the imposter. He uses imitations for comedy. Steve never accepted that he was a multiple personality. He was made to be undesirable because his comedy caused his family problems. Lee is the prankster and his practical jokes normally get the family into trouble. He does not care about the consequences for his actions. He was made an undesirable because one of his jokes put them in solitary confinement. Jason is the pressure valve. He was used at the beginning to release tension for the family, but he caused them to get into too much trouble and was marked as an undesirable. Bobby always has dreams of leading some adventure or fixing some global crisis, but he has no ambitions and was labeled due to that fact. Sean, who is four and deaf, makes buzzing sounds so he can feel the vibration in his head. He was labeled an undesirable because there was no benefit from being deaf later in life. Martin is a snob from New York. He wants things just handed over to him without earning them. Timothy worked in a flower shop until he encountered a gay man who flirted with him. He went into his own little world after that. After Billy's time in the hospital, he was able to create a 24th personality which is neither one of the 10 or the undesirables called the teacher. 
The teacher was by far the greatest milestone to helping Billy achieve fusion. He is the sum of all 24 people put together, and has almost total recollection of all the other people's thoughts and actions. Billy was released in 1988 after a decade in the mental hospitals, and discharged from the Ohio Mental Health System and the Ohio Courts on August 1st, 1991. In 1996, he lived in California where he owned Stormy Life Productions and was going to make a short film, which apparently has never been made. His location thereafter remained for a long time unknown. His former acquaintances had lost contact with him. Billy died of cancer at a nursing home in Columbus, Ohio on December 12, 2014. He was 59. That is the story of Billy Milligan, but if you're interested in reading more about Billy Milligan's mental illness and crimes, there was a book written that goes fully in depth into the psyche of Billy, called The Minds of Billy Milligan, written by Daniel Keyes. But now I want to know what you guys believe. Do you think these crimes were Billy's fault, or was he just a victim of his mental illness? Let us know in the comments below. We hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, please leave a like and maybe even subscribe for more great content. We do all the research so you don't have to. And as always, I'm Alex and I hope you have a fantastic day. Within the roots of the trees that we planted in the graveyard I don't think these scars will ever fade off Good thing nothing seems to phase us So numb